Hello, I'm Paul Rigda, superintendent of the Elyria Schools, and welcome to this year's State of the School. This year we're going to do it a little bit different, and we're going to bring you exactly the same kind of information, but we're going to bring it to you in a different kind of format that I think will be interesting, and I think it's going to be a little more exciting to uh, stay tuned with us while I give you that update. We're going to hear from administrators today, we're going to hear from teachers, and we're also going to hear from uh, quite a few uh, students who are involved in our different programs. First thing we're going to do is take a ride over to Crestwood Elementary School, where we're going to see a couple of things. Mrs. Coleman's going to be there at Crestwood Elementary, and she's doing a math lesson in a different way. So it'll be interesting to hear what she has to say and what she's doing with her students. Mr. Charlie Rudd will also be there. He's our technology guru in the district this year. Excellent classroom teacher that we brought out to work out of central office to help our teachers in the use of state-of-the-art technology within the district. So he'll be there talking to us about some new things that he's doing, and I think you're going to find that exciting as well. We'll see how technology helps us not only in the classroom, but out in the field as we use the technology in the maintenance department as they track their work orders and determine which way they're going to go. And also, the custodial department helps our schools be leaders in environmental efficiencies. You'll also get a glimpse into the new Elyria High School where it's a very vibrant place already. We bring a very energetic new principal, Dr. Jama, into the high school this year. You'll be hearing from him and we'll be meeting the Sodexo manager who's in charge of the brand new kitchen that feeds 7,000 students because that kitchen is used as a district-wide kitchen for lunches and breakfasts each day. You'll be inspired by a truly unique group of students at, at Eastern Heights Middle School this year who have made it their goal to stamp out bullying. You'll hear about how things uh, that we're doing have to be done by putting the right people in the right places as we downsize our district. Academically, we've had a great year this year. On the state report card, two of our schools were rated as excellent, McKinley Elementary School. They were rated excellent for the third time in four years, so congratulations to McKinley. Westwood Middle School was rated excellent this year. This was their first time, so we've had two schools for the first time ever uh, in the Larry School's history being rated as excellent on the state report card. On top of that, many of our schools were rated effective. Everyone's been doing a great job. We're really happy about that, and we're looking forward to our scores on this year's report card coming up. Okay, well, enough with the introductions. This is supposed to be on the road with the superintendent, so let's get on the road. Why don't we go over to Crestwood Elementary School? Crestwood's over in the township, and uh, actually, we've got three really uh, nice schools here in the township. There's the village in the township, uh, Crestwood Elementary, whose scores just have been uh, improving with each year. They've done such a nice job, and uh, Westwood Middle School is in the township and they were rated excellent last year on Ohio's report card so uh, we're very proud of them they're very happy they're celebrating this year of, of excellence and uh, uh, kind of a little sleeper school there we've often heard in the news so much about Northwood and Eastern Heights but uh, Westwood out in the township came through this year and were rated excellent so very very proud of them we're going over to Crestwood to see a couple of uh, I don't want to know. I don't want to really call them uh, innovative uh, kinds of, of strategies, but they're certainly best practices. And I think there's no coincidence between the work that our academic services department does with our teachers and the professional development they provide, and a couple of the things that we believe that we're getting better scores from are the uh, concepts of uh, guided math and using technology in the classroom. And we'll be able to see a guided math lesson when we get there. Uh, guided math, as you'll see when we get there, is, uh, again, not necessarily a, a brand new concept, but it's pulling a lot of concepts together that we've already had in education and came up with uh, something that's fun and, and newer to the students. It's uh, a refreshing way to look at mathematics and both the staff and the students enjoy that. We'll meet up with our Director of Academic Services over there, Ann Schloss, and she'll walk us through that. Uh, Mr. Rudd, we call him Charlie Rudd, uh, was a former teacher at Crestwood, 
elementary school and we have him on a special assignment now. He's an implementation specialist and he'll be working with technologies in the classroom and one of the big things we do with technology in the classroom uh, is the usage of the smart boards. So uh, he was very good at that when uh, he was teaching and what we asked him to do and he agreed to do is become a specialist in the district where he goes to all of our schools, elementary, middle school, and high school and shares all of the latest strategies and best practices in the use of technology. So we'll get to see him in action and hopefully uh, we'll be able to ask him a few questions about uh, how he thinks that's going and maybe some ideas about uh, technology in the future. So we should be there in, in just a couple of seconds. Well, hello. How are we? Mrs. Parent, how are you? Good, nice to see you. Thanks for coming to Crossroads. Well, thank you for having us. This Absolutely. is great. Yes. Hello. Mr. Schloss is Good here, too. Nice to see you. Hello, hello. Mr. Rudd, hello. Good afternoon. Well, I was talking about all of you in the car on the way over, so great. I told him that we were going to watch Mr. Rudd in some sort of lesson, and he's going to tell us uh, some things about technology in the classroom. And we also talked about uh, the mathematics program and the guided math. And we talked about how Crestwood's really shooting up with scores and all of the stuff is paying off and all the hard work here is making it all happen. That's right. Excellent. So I happen to have one of these with me. Right. So I'm going to hand this over yes. to you all. And I'll do my best. Why don't you just show us around and tell us where you want us to go. Okay. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Rudd before we move along. This is Charlie Rudd. He is our new implementation specialist for technology. And one of the great things we've done this year is we're trying to go from good to great on the technology side. And Charlie has come up with some new ways of, pro of providing professional development for our teachers. So we're going to walk you over to the Media Center, and I'm going to let Charlie take the mic and kind of explain a few things on our way. Well, initially, the academic services team has always been very proud of the fact that we've led a lot of the uh, pro professional development seminars and uh, we continue to do that. Uh, the three things that we have begun this year which are particularly pleasing to me, uh, one, are, one would be a tech tip type of email um, send off, I, I guess I should say, that we send to the uh, entire district. It's about a 60 to 90 second uh, film clip on some of the more exciting tips, tricks, and techniques that we have, you know, particularly with regard to a smart board. Uh, that's one thing that we have done this year that has been relatively new. Uh, we are also proud of the fact that um, the academic services team has come up with a series of screencasts that is comprised of, I, we probably have maybe anywhere, anywhere from 30 to 35 different screencasts covering four different topics. And uh, there are three different instructors who, who create those different screencasts. They average anywhere from about 90 seconds to, to seven minutes. And so uh, that has been particularly helpful. And they are posted on our website. And so you can really access those anywhere uh, from any PC or Mac that has, obviously, that has internet access. And for the do we want to take them sure. down and show them where let's, that's let's, let's go. Well, you also do a university piece, don't you? Uh, we do. Uh, Elyria University is brand new. Mm -hmm. um, that Elyria University today is one online technology class taught by one instructor, and okay. that's me. Very um, good. But the Elyria University of tomorrow will hopefully be several different online classes covering an array of curricular topics taught by several different instructors. Excellent. And that is only for Elyria teachers. And our teachers never have to leave, uh, leave their home or leave their no. classroom? No, they do not. This is all online? It is all online. Beautiful. And we, we limit the classes to about 20 at any particular time. And uh, it's advantageous from a couple different standpoints. First of all, the, uh, the expense of it, it's, it's very, very cheap. It's, there is no expense. Uh, there's no instructional fee. That's the cheapest fee. it gets. Yes. <laughs> there's no instructional fee. There's no technology fee. If they want the credit, they pay. Whatever the, the credit cost. Yeah. Wonderful. So, where, where are we? In the Media Center? We're in the Media Center. There we go. <coughs> this page was accessed from our website. And this is a series of all of the instructional screencasts that cover an area. Okay, that cover an area of uh, smart board. Where we have different screencasts. The, the teacher simply clicks on the, uh, the icon. And then we have... What will hopefully come up is all of our series of, uh, of screencasts specifically for smart board. Um, that's not the only item that we have. Uh, we can also go down to 
the AIMS web section. We have several different screencasts for AIMS web. We continue down to the Everyday Math Online each week. And then the last designation would be for Wilson Language Training. All of these wonderful PD opportunities for teachers, small snippets of information. It's, it's very quick, very fast for teachers who are very, very busy. And we're very proud of that as well. The one thing that is really exciting about this is teachers are able to access this 24-7, which makes it really nice for those teachers who are unable to stay past, you know, 4 o'clock in the afternoon for professional development. They can get it at 10 o'clock at night when their little ones are in bed. So this has made it so that everyone can get the same professional development. Now I think what we're going to do is we're going to head down to see some guided math lesson in Mrs. Coleman's room. This year we're trying to pilot a new program called Guided Math. Um, for years in O'Leary City Schools we've had guided reading and we know that guided reading has really helped us help students. It's getting down to the individualized instruction that we need to help each, each student reach their reading goals. Well, knowing that that is good practice, we've tried to bring that into the math setting and we have developed a guided math program of which we're piloting at three schools, Oakwood, Crestwood, and Franklin. And this is one room that is piloting it here at Crestwood, a third grade Mrs. Coleman. So let's go in and see. This is a third grade math room. And as you will see, just like we have in reading, how it is structured is you have math stations and then you have a small group getting direct instruction. And what happens is all of the students get their direct instruction at their level. And right up here we have Mrs. Coleman and a great group of students getting their direct instruction. I'm going to hand the mic over to Mrs. Coleman and have her tell you a little bit about what she's doing. Fabulous, Mrs. Coleman. <laughs> <laughs> this is my guided group, and the others are in stations. We've got a game station and a computation station. So what I'm doing right now with this group, we're starting a unit on fractions, and we're working on finding equivalent fractions. We just finished up a small lesson with our fraction cards where we were going through our cards and finding equivalent fractions. The students are set up with partners. So there's a group, but they also each have a math buddy. And so they worked with their math buddy. I gave them each a different fraction, and they had to go through their cards and find the equivalent fractions in their deck. Now what we're going to do is we're about to play a game from Everyday Math that is equivalent fractions and we're going to um, demonstrate how to play it on the smart board so that when they're in their game station they can play it independently with their partner. It helps me learn by, um, by um, practicing fractions, division, and multiplication. And one of the things the kids have said to me before that they really like about this is because there's more individualized attention in the small group. If they're struggling, while we were just comparing fractions, if they're struggling, I'm right there on the carpet. I can deal with that issue right then and there. They don't have to wait for me to get around the room to get to them. They don't have to raise their hand forever. I'm right here. I see it right away. And I can intervene immediately and deal with whatever they're struggling with. Um, other things that they've said is that when they're in stations, they like working with their math buddy because they're not doing it alone. They have someone that is there to help them right then and there. They don't have to come to Mrs. Coleman, which leads to independence in their learning, and um, they have someone to lean on when they're struggling. <laughs> um, Hello. Crestwood is one of three buildings that's piloting this for us, and next year will be district-wide. But some exciting news is we've, got a, we've gotten a call from Everyday Math, and they would like to come to our training in June for the teachers because the packets we've put together, they think are far better than the ones they've put together. Wow. So they would like to use our model. So we're really excited about that because they've taken notice of some of the things we're doing in the area, with Mrs. Coleman's class being one of the pilot groups and helping us get that data so excellent job third grade thank you thank you mrs coleman very good thank you nice job wow that was really great thank you so thank much you, Mr. Mr. oh that was fabulous we hear about those things but watching it happen in the classroom is very special and thank you for all that you added to this and all that, you're coming. that discussion about technology mm -hmm. very very interesting thank you keep it up look forward to that university growing and thank you for all the work that you do My thank you you know we were talking about technology 
and how important it is in the classroom and that best practices are utilized in the classroom. But we use technology outside of the classroom. There's the obvious one where we're in our offices with our computers, but we even use technology out in the field in the maintenance department. So let's go see what our maintenance men are doing with technology right now. My name is Roger Fleming. I'm the lead carpenter for Larry City School District and I guess we're here to talk about technology. I will have to say technology has come a long ways in the past 10 years in this district, not including the past 30 years since I've been working here. But anyway, back 10 years ago, I had to stop at school buildings to look up my work order tickets and look up my job descriptions to give out to the department. And now we have this handy dandy laptop that we can have in the, la in the van that um, goes over all my work order tickets that I have for the district. Then I can print them up for the guys. Then they can go out to their job. And also they have, it's pretty much you edit the job ticket when you come in then it pretty much tells you where you're at and it says doorbell rings but buzzer will not unlock door that's an example of one of the tickets then you pretty much have a description of when you send the guys to the job um, I, I love this technology this, this is the best thing that could ever happen for, for me and my department this is the best thing that could ever happen. Heading back over to the board office and getting back to the board office, I was mentioning earlier about the three great schools here in the township and one of the schools, the Kindergarten Village, is going to change its look for next year because at the end of this year we're going to go from two early childhood centers back to one. Uh, there's the Spring Valley Early Childhood Center which currently houses our preschool program and it houses the kindergartners for Windsor Elementary School. But for next year, we have room at Windsor for the kindergartners, finally. So all three of the classes will be relocated back to Windsor from Spring Valley. We'll be closing Spring Valley. Uh, that'll uh, consolidate our early childhood program so that it's all in the village. And it's going to save the district quite a lot of money. Uh, we should be able to realize at least a $300,000 per year savings by closing Spring Valley. And then we'll even uh, have more money uh, should we be able to sell it. And there was a time I would have said, uh, who buys a school building? But we've already sold three of them. So we're very optimistic that because of the neighborhood that Spring Valley is located in, uh, there will be some interest in that school for a variety of uses and uh, the school district can even make a few more dollars, which is, I hope, very, very good news to our taxpayers who are watching this. Speaking of taxpayers and finances, let's see if the treasurer's in. He's always got some fun things for us to hear about regarding our, our budget. Mr. Stevens. Mr. Rigga, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? It's nice to see you. Thank you. Thank nice you. you. Why don't you have a seat? Well, I th you know, I think I will. Why don't you have a seat? I thought maybe we could have a short conversation. I'll hand you that microphone. That sounds great. On our way back from one of the schools that we just visited, we were talking about district finances very little bit. Right. And that got me to thinking that, you know, we should come over and talk to the treasurer about just how we're doing. I, I did mention one thing that we're going to do this year that should save us quite a bit of money, and that's consolidate our early childhood program. We should probably save $300,000 uh, between the utilities and the salaries that were involved in that. And I know that as a treasurer, every time I say I'm saving you money, not spending money, it makes you smile like it, this. It so, puts a warm feeling in my heart. There yes, we go. Yes, well, yes. why don't we talk just a little bit uh, about where we are because so many districts are in so much trouble right now but right now knock on wood and keep our fingers crossed we seem to be holding our own 
Absolutely, we're holding our own. It's in a turbulent environment out there, but we've done a lot of the right things over the last, not just last year, but over the last five or six years to make sure that we're prepared for a financial downturn like we had. For example, this closing of the Spring Valley, we know how much we're going to save on that because we've closed other schools. And we did them in such a way that, uh, you know, it was almost uh, seamless to the community and, and they've still, we're still providing the service while saving the district money. And it really is about getting the bigger bang out of our dollar. Absolutely, we have to. You know, we have some challenges. We have to, we have to uh, report to the state in the form of a five-year forecast every year what our balance is going to be, not just this year, but five years out. And we're required to maintain a positive balance and even over a positive balance, you know, something like 2% greater than a positive balance uh, just to uh, uh, be okay uh, with the state that they don't come in and tell us how to run yeah. our business. And, and you know, we don't want that. We want Mr. Rigg to, to <laughs> run our business here. Well, we 2% doesn't sound like much, but 2% of our budget right now is close to a couple million dollars, isn't it? Yeah, it's almost $1.7 million would be probably 2% of our, our, our budget. And uh, uh, that is a big number. It's kind of a rainy day piece the state makes us have. They Correct. just don't let us spend down to zero. Absolutely. It's just like you're at home with your finances. You know, if you're spending down to zero, uh, your family's in trouble. And that's the same with school districts. If you're spending down to zero or, or worried about where your next dime's coming from, you can't make good educational decisions or uh, uh, decisions on what's best for the kids in our district. Well, we're in 2012, and in your line of work, you call that fiscal year 12. Right. And we're black. We're good. Absolutely. Fiscal year 13, we're good. Absolutely. And fiscal year 14, we think we're pretty good. That's the one where you start to get three years out. You have to be a little bit of a fortune teller, don't you? Right, right. Uh, if, if we're not black in 2014, we get a letter from the state telling us to correct that deficiency and come up with a plan to, to make ourselves black. Uh, we don't want that letter. We want to be proactive and do those things before we're told by an outside entity. Uh, we have some challenges in our budget and the, about 50% of our revenue comes from uh, real estate taxes. And they've been challenged on a number of fronts this year. Firstly, uh, the valuation. Uh, in the past, say before the big decline we had, in 2009, a mill would bring in about a million dollars in revenue to us, a mil million dollars of tax right. revenue. Uh, now, uh, with the new valuations of the property, only brings in 850000 So for the same mill, we get less money. Less. In addition to that, a lot of people uh, are struggling and on hard times, and they are paying their taxes, and we have delinquencies of a million and a half that we were expecting those uh, dollars to come in in previous forecasts, but they didn't. We will get them one of these days, but we don't know when. That's really a good point. I, I think when people hear that uh, some people can't pay their tax bill and they fall behind, and you're talking about a million and a half in terms of tax dollar delinquency, that affects the school district because about 50% of our funding uh, is dependent upon that, that tax valuation, isn't it? That tax oh, collection. Absolutely. You have 50% and then 50% comes from the state and uh, uh, other uh, forms of uh, revenue. But even on the state side, we're challenged too in that the state has had declining revenues. This year, there's a little bit of uh, uh, positive news, but nothing that's going to give us additional money uh, in the Mm -hmm. near future. Uh, we're, we're, we're going to end up uh, probably getting about the same money from the state that we got in previous years with a couple of exceptions and they're big ones. Number one, are the charter schools that uh, we have around the city, uh, those are growing and when they grow we have to pay the state share plus a local share of that money to the charter schools which adds up to a total of around $5,700 per student. In addition to that, there's open enrollment with all the surrounding uh, schools mm -hmm. where we lose some kids to that. Mm -hmm. We lose them every year, but that has been growing too, and we're keeping an mm -hmm. eye on that uh, uh, for this current so coming physical year. So between open enrollment year. and the charter schools, we lose about $3 million or so? Well, between the two of them, we lose more like uh, $6 million. $6 million. $6 million a year, mm -hmm. and that's every year. Mm -hmm. And if those kids would come back, I mean, it would be a lot less burden on the, mm -hmm. the public school system. Mm -hmm. But right now, uh, 
They I have the right they, to go to those I schools. I wish they, they would come back. Uh, by the time people are, are done watching this State of the Schools video, they'll see all that we have to offer. And uh, with all due respect to what the charter schools are trying to do, they can't possibly put the kinds of equipment and technologies and highly trained staff that, that we do. So all in all, we're a, a good uh, a bang for the buck. We, we give a lot of service for the dollars that we do collect. Absolutely, and our state dollars are going to those schools. And uh, the, the thing about it is that they are not uh, required to perform under the same rules that we are and yeah. the same standards, and they're trying to get them in line with us. But right now, uh, we're held to stricter, stricter standards, and we're, our performance is uh, monitored much more closely. Right, and, and, and forever uh, in a day, we have to watch that bottom line. And I know that anyone who pays taxes wants to make sure that we're squeezing every we bit go. of service we can out of every dollar. And I know you're the guy that's going to help us do that. Absolutely, but I do not do not do it. I report on how we squeeze the dollars, <laughs> but it's all the good work that the administration, the Board of Education, and the staff have done in actually squeezing every uh, penny in our, our budget. Uh, we've saved money on supplies while not shorting any of the student supplies, right. just getting better deals and, and not stockpiling as much and those types of things. Right. We used to have a warehouse full of things. Warehouse full. We closed the warehouse. We're becoming more efficient and effective, computerizing more things. All the mm -hmm. student records now are computerized, <clears throat> and so we don't have to, uh, to manage right. those thousands of boxes of records uh, year after year. And, and maintain all the cost of uh, doing that. We belong to the Ohio Schools Council. Yeah, we sure. get a discount on electricity and gas. Right. The Those are two huge expenses. Correct. The governor uh, you know, has the idea of uh, cooperative uh, enterprises and partnerships. Well, we've been doing that for a long time mm -hmm. with, the, as you say, the co-ops and working with other districts. Uh, it, it's been a wonderful thing and have saved us a lot of money over the years, especially in the field of natural gas. And our new high school has got that new uh, Geothermal. Uh, geothermal system mm -hmm. with the 300 wells that take the heat out of the and coolness out of the ground and convert that to into building uh, use. So uh, it's a wonderful thing. The new high school, it seems as though uh, we're air conditioning and heating the high school for about the same money as it costs just to heat the old one. So, so we are very, seeing some savings. That's wonderful. Absolutely. And they're so much more comfortable inside. And the, the kids are doing so well there. So. Yeah, you can actually have summer school in the summer there. Now. That's you nice. Know, that's really good, yes. Well, thank you for spending some time with us. Well, it's Appreciate been it. a pleasure. Come thank by you. anytime. Thank you. Balancing the budget takes an enormous amount of time. Revenue reductions and unexpected costs trigger deficits that grow exponentially. For an example, Gasoline prices right now are climbing close to the $4 mark. As costs, supposedly, have gone up in the oil industry, the price of our gas goes up almost on a daily basis. In schools, we can't do that. We have revenue reductions and we have unexpected costs, but we're expected to bring the best possible education to our students every day based on levies that passed five and ten years ago, along with the reductions from the state and unclaimed and unpaid property taxes. If we were to bring gasoline prices, for example, to a vote, I wonder how much we'd be paying for gasoline today. Hello, Mr. Taylor. Hey, Paul. How are how, you? How are you doing? Yeah, good. I'm good. I'm good. Right. I just came from uh, Mr. Stevens' office, and we oh. were talking about the budget. And related to the budget is this whole idea of getting the right people in the right job as you're involved in downsizing an organization, because the more we have to do with less, and usually at our end of the business, that means fewer people, mm -hmm. Yes. the more qualified they have to be for the position, the more ready they have to be. Uh, when it's time for them to get to work. Mm -hmm. So we've been spending a lot of time, I know administratively, to try to get the right administrators in the right position because mm -hmm. that same amount of work has to get done, Correct. but with fewer people. Right. So we're just trying to match everybody up administratively, but I know you've been working very hard at matching up some very important people in our district, classroom teachers, because since we're service-oriented, that's the point of service, the classroom. So. Maybe you could talk to us a little bit about uh, 
What's this program that you found that could help us find the right people right out of the gate? Well, that's a great, great question, Paul. Um, as you probably know, each year uh, we'll recruit anywhere from 30 to 50 certified teachers in this district, which is pretty significant. And last year, for example, we received over 2,300 applicants. And one of the tools that we've been looking at, and I'm pleased to say that we'll have in place for this year's recruiting season is what we call a job fit assessment. Uh, this is going to be an online assessment. Uh, it's a product that's delivered through a company called Apex Solutions. And it's a psychometric test or assessment that our candidates will be able to take online. It takes approximately 30 to 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. And what the, the assessment will measure is about six to seven competency areas. And if you look here online, these are the areas that we believe are critical for success in the classroom on the part of our classroom teachers. Fairness and respect, concern for student learning, adaptability, communication and persuasion, planning and organizing, and cultural competence. And so each applicant will spend time answering a series of questions. We will then get a report back from Apex Solutions that gives an assessment of the cultural fit of applicants into our district. This is measured against a uh, data bank of thousands of other applicants throughout the United States for teaching positions. So this information will be another tool to help us winnow down candidates from that 2300 to candidates that we believe will be successful and effective in our classroom. That's really interesting. So when our principals go to look at applications, they'll see the results of this uh, test and then we'll have, I'm sure, a number or so that should be their target number. Talk to people at this number or above. People with uh, <clears throat> a number under that and below will probably not be a fit. That's correct. Earlier I mentioned that Elyria High School was a vibrant place this year with a brand new principal. And before we talk to that brand new principal, Dr. Thomas Jama, let me just say one thing about something that's coming up on June 2nd. So consider this a save the date card. On June 2nd of this year, we're going to have an open house that will run in the morning, the uh, afternoon, and there's going to be a red and white ball in the evening at the Elyria Country Club. And it's a great way to celebrate the completion of this school. Believe it or not, it's been five years since this bond issue passed, and it's taken us all this time. But good things, you have to wait. 330,000 square feet, much to be celebrated. Please keep us in mind. Come and see us on June 2nd, this year, on Saturday, and we'll have a great time at our celebration in an open house. Now, let's go find Dr. Jama. I'm happy to inform uh, the people out there of our new 411, 911, and freshman and sophomore mentoring programs that have been implemented here this year at Elyria High School. Um, when I came into the building, I sat down with the administrative team and we talked about issues that are uh, plaguing our students and not being successful in the classroom. And the same uh, answer came about that some of our kids just needed to be monitored more closely and have that special person or that relationship with a caring adult in the building. So our senior 911 program has been set up whereby we have uh, each team has in between 10 and 15 seniors. These are seniors who are at risk of not graduating this year due to credits or OGT situations. Um, these seniors meet with the team counselor and the team principal on a weekly basis, whereby when they come to the meetings, they have to show a grade report. We discuss their attendance, and they also talk about just personal issues that are affecting the entire group, whether it's home issues, whether it's issues that's plaguing them outside of school. But again, it's just connecting that senior with a caring adult or caring adults in this case. Basically the same program has been set up for the juniors, but it's a little bit more informative on what they need to do to get to the next level. The seniors is specifically what needs to happen to graduate. 
We're going to be doing a senior project that has been announced to our juniors this year that will actually be implemented during the 2012-2013 uh, school year. A select group of juniors will have an opportunity to partake in the senior project whereby they will be involved in a career or an opportunity that they are interested in. It will take place throughout the year gathering information. There will be a committee of teachers and administrators who monitor the group as well as an individual who works with that person individually. The juniors will have an opportunity, I believe it's the last six weeks of school, they will not attend classes at all at O'Leary High School. They will take a, a full-time uh, opportunity to work in their specific field. For, for example, um, I've had students who've worked with Dr. Zanotti at uh, the, uh, the, the Bone Specialist Center in Sheffield. The students who were involved in that opportunity actually did surgeries, had an opportunity to be in the waiting room, had an opportunity to be in the surgery room, had an opportunity to be with the physical therapy department. So they actually shadowed the physician and all the, uh, the career people within that field. As you walk around our building here at O'Leary High School, you'll see signs that say 55%, 57%, which are currently posted throughout the building. Um, we took a challenge during the uh, second grading period to try to earn 55%. And what does that 55% mean? 55% of our students will have a 3.0 or higher on, uh, during the second grading period. And we hit that goal during the second grading period. Um, we talk about it every single day in the building when announcements are done. 55% or 57% is red. Now the 57% that are currently hanging everywhere in the building, and I mean everywhere, every classroom, every hallway, every door, um, there's a poster that says 57% uh, if you believe you will succeed, and that's our goal for the third grading period. Um, students are going to be urged to, to kick it up a notch from the second grading period and try to reach 57%. That means 57% of our students will uh, have a 3.0 or higher. One of the areas when I spoke to the kids earlier in the year when I took over the position, they wanted to get pride back into the building. Pride with them being an active participant in creating that pride and moving the building forward. So we sat down, I spoke with several seniors and juniors who were interested in becoming a, a cheer squad section leader. We sat down, we developed the name of Pioneer Pack. Um, and we just started the, uh, the excitement amongst the entire student body to show up at games, be excited. We sit in a special location in the gymnasium as well as a special location out at the stadium. Um, we had 100 plus kids at the games this year, which is very, very exciting. The community loved the idea of getting kids back involved in the games for two reasons. One, it shows a lot about the spirit and pride in the school, but I'm a firm believer is that when the kids are accounted for here in school and doing an active program, they're behaving themselves and not doing anything else that they shouldn't be outside of school. I just, I believe keeping kids involved is the most important thing you can do as a building administrator. The, uh, the, the administrative team, staff, and I strongly believe in allowing students to be leaders within the building. We uh, uh, developed a new, a new program here this year, and uh, it takes the, the president or the leader of an organization within the building to uh, become part of a larger picture called the President's Club. So each president of each organization meets on a monthly basis. We meet with the superintendent of schools. We meet with you, Amy. Uh, a board member is informed about the information as well as any staff member who wants to participate. They're working on several uh, ideas right now from planting a tree to uh, reading to kids at the elementary building which has taken place this week to uh, just developing programs and ideas that help improve not only Elyria High School but the community of Elyria as well. When the new building was under construction, there was much priority placed on green building materials and methods. Uh, we felt that we could take that to the next level by looking at the chemicals and uh, machines that we plan to use uh, to keep the building clean. For instance, this machine here uh, effectively cleans the floors without any chemical, just plain water that is electrically charged by the machine. We found it to be cost effective to implement a green cleaning program which reduces environmental impacts, improves indoor air quality, and also uh, increases the safety of students, staff, and visitors. Well, I really never use green products, but I've, we have used them here recently and I found out that they are really effective and they really do work. 
and with uh, our staff, they're really um, they're more knowledgeable with the green because we only use like three products and we have like a hydrant peroxide that cleans just about everything and we use a window cleaner and a disinfectant and we got rid of more of the harsher chemicals and when subs come into the building we are able to train them better because we're not using like 20 different chemicals we're just using like three so you know green products do work and that's what we like to use now because we're really used to using them and they are effective. Hi, I'm Rich Nielsen, Director of Business Services, and I'm here in the brand new Elyria High Kitchen. And I've got Awen Adams with me. Awen's our General Manager of Food Services. And I'm going to let Awen talk a little bit about what this new kitchen has meant for the food service program. Well, we moved over to the, the new kitchen in December, um, and it's where we prepare the meals for the entire district. So all the elementary schools and middle schools come out of this kitchen, um, as well as our new dining program in the high school. Um, as you can see, we have tons of new equipment, including a new combi oven, which has really given us a lot of uh, capability with our menu here at the high school and out in the district. Hey, well, why don't you give us a little bit of a feel for some of the things that you can make in the combi oven and how that differs from what we were able to do before? Um, this is a combi oven. It's part steamer, part oven. Um, it can be either one, and it also gives us the capability to, it acts almost like a deep fryer. It has a crisp and tasty feature, is what they call it, but um, it crisps french fries, um, chicken nuggets, chicken patties, almost like a deep fryer would, but in a much healthier way for the students. We moved over out of the kitchen area now into the serving area where the students come in and really get the variety of offerings that we're able to provide them here. And I'm going to have Awen speak a little bit more about how we've been able to expand that greatly and have healthier offerings and how the kids have reacted to that. Well, with some of the new equipment we have, um, we have charbroil grills and flat tops we're able to use to make um, made-to-order burgers fresh off the grill. We also have a made-to-order deli line where the students can get sub sandwiches and wraps made the way they like and made to order. And we just opened recently our creation station. Um, this week is a burrito station. It's like Chipotle almost exactly, except we are using fat-free sour cream, low-fat cheese, um, whole grain rice for the kids. And we've seen our participation go up by 200 meals a day with the changes that we've implemented. In addition to having the brand new kitchen with the serving area here, the, the high school has really given us an opportunity to expand our offerings in other areas. We have a Wi-Fi cafe, we're going to be opening a rat skeller down in the basement of the Washington building, and Awen can speak a little bit about that and some of the things we offer there and what that means for the variety that we're able to offer. The three points of service um, that we have for the students in the high school, we're really trying to embrace the concept of a campus environment for the students so that they're really learning what it's like to be in a higher education environment, um, giving them responsibility, and kind of letting them experience the different venues that we have for them in the school. I mentioned earlier about an intriguing group of students at Eastern Heights Middle School who are stamping out bullying. Um, many of you would think that I was the bully in school. But it was quite the opposite. I was the person that hid in the corner. I was the person that was told I was dumb. I was the person that every teacher said, you need to be quiet. I don't believe you. You're too big. Nobody's going to pick on you. And I believed them. And so for the next eight years, I pretended I was dumb. And I pretended that I didn't know anything and I sat in the back of the corner and I got sent to the office once or twice a week. In November of 2010 I approached uh, Dr. Bonetto and I brought up the idea of having something um, that would resemble an anti-bully group or club and she, her exact quote to me was great minds think alike. She had already been thinking about it and so we started to you know talk about it figure out how we would want to do it and we had kids write letters if they wanted to join and then we gave them hand delivered invitations to our first meeting and we had over 92 kids I believe at our first meeting um, it's certainly they have to have good grades they have to have good behavior it started there and it has just grown ever since we did a rally at Eastern Heights last year 
Um, and we did not visit any other schools last year, but we started visiting elementary schools this year. This program is key in society today because so many kids don't think words hurt. They are immune to Facebook, texting. They are immune to things that they write and say because they live in a digital world. And kids get hurt, and then kids end up hurting themselves. And that is critical. That is why I believe it's the number one reason we're here, is to prevent kids from hurting themselves because they've been hurt. Acceptance is the key. We're all different. We live in a very diverse community, and they are very accepting of each other to a certain extent, and we need to educate them how to be accepting of each other the whole way. The Ohio Schools Facility Commission is back. Last time when we passed the bond issue for Elyria High School, the state paid 39% of the cost. It since has gone up to 43%, and by the end of this year, 47%. I think you'll find this next session interesting. It's a session that we call This Old School. Well, we're standing here outside of McKinley Elementary School. McKinley is over 100 years old, and uh, this original portion was built over 100 years ago, and there are a couple other sections that were built more recently in the uh, 60s era. Um, this building is a stately old building for sure, and has served a, a wealth of purposes over the years, but. Buildings reach a useful life, and the normal life of a school building is approximately 50 years. So we're seeing the wear and tear on a building that's just normal to be expected after something that's been around twice of what you would expect. Um, if you look in the lower area, we can see some of the damage that water has done to foundation areas. This school was built on two levels. As we move off toward East River, it's a lower level. This part is a higher level, so water has played some damage. Also on the top part of the building, the roof area and around the roof walls, known as the parapet walls, those also have experienced some problems that we've had to address on a continuing basis, which has increased our expenditures for maintenance and upkeep on the building. Um, as has the roof on the, the newer section, because even with the building that was built in the 60s, we're way past the useful life of that roof. So we continue to experience some challenges with the building, and and need to look at ways to address that and, and try to minimize the dollar that we put into the building but still keep it in a safe condition and a, a good condition for education. One of the challenges we face as we approach this building is this entrance door is on the lower level of a three-story building and we have to go up and inside the building to get to the main office and we'll see that as we walk in. Um, that, that poses certainly some issues for security right now because we like to have an area where the office can monitor who's coming in and see that directly and we really don't have that here. So we have a buzzer system and a camera that we put in which certainly provides some measure of security but it's not as effective as if we had the kind of an arrangement where you could see who was coming and let them in or not let them in or be able to at least know who was out there. Also it poses challenges for the ADA because the building is not handicapped accessible, the older building. While the newer building is, it's all on one floor, this building is on three different levels. So as we get into the vestibule area and start moving up the stairs, you get a sense of how far removed this door is from the main office, which is up this first flight of stairs. Down that flight of stairs are some classroom space, some restrooms, and that's really the lower level of the building. And then we finally reach the point where we're getting close to the main office area right now. We're standing right now in the main office area, or just outside the main office area, in the main hallway on the, uh, the second level, as opposed to the lower level of the building. And I'm here with Principal Chip Hall of McKinley Elementary School. And Chip is going to share a few of the, uh, the issues that he sees in a building of this age and configuration as we try to deliver today's educational program. Well, thank you, Mr. Nelson. Uh, one of the things as you look around, you notice you see all the crowded area right here in the office. It's our main hallway, and yet we still have five tables set up where we have paraprofessionals and other teachers working with students in the hallway because we just don't have the space. I mean, we have storage here right behind us. We have music storage here, workstation behind us further yet. It's a pretty crowded place here. 
You can definitely see that, and you can see that just in the hallway area that we're at. I imagine if we started walking through some of the other halls and going into classrooms, you could even see more of that. Oh, definitely. Uh, as you can see, our office, main office area is really outside, built into the hallway. We have a similar room upstairs that we use for tutoring. There are also a number of tables upstairs in the hallway that are used for tutoring. If we were to go down onto the main floor of the newer sections, which is over 60 years old, you would see we're using the boys' and girls' locker rooms for classroom space, and we've taken away all of the storage space that our custodian usually has, and we're using that for classroom space. That's amazing. Well, let's take a little walk maybe and look at one of the rooms in this building and then go to that new area and look at some of those rooms that you've had to convert from locker rooms. All right, let's do that. Mr. Nelson, this is one of our first grade rooms. As you can see, every bit of space has been utilized in here. Um, this is a very typical class size that we have. Um, our computer workstation is up against the wall. One of the bad things about that is sometimes when the roof does leak, it, the water does come down from the second floor onto this floor, and we have to worry about the stuff that is along the wall. Um, you can tell as it's crowded, it does make learning difficult just because of everybody's proximity to one another while they're in the room. There's really not a lot of quiet workspace here. Well, the kids are doing a great job. Kids are doing a great job in this room, as does the teacher, Mrs. Friday. All right, Mr. Nielsen, we're currently in the coat room for Mrs. Friday's room. As you can see by some of the paint damage up above me here. Um, I mean, the, the roof continually gets fixed, but in between the fixings, when it does leak, water comes down through the top floor to this floor. Uh, the painter is constantly fixing up the areas. Uh, he just hasn't gotten here yet. Uh, also, as you can see, the rest of the coat room is pretty crowded in here. And because in these older buildings, they were never really built for storage areas, I mean, the teacher has to store all of her materials in this room. And as you can see, the kids' coats are in here. This is the uh, roof area of the uh, fir first floor portion of the building that was approximately 50 or 60 years old. So this is a newer portion. And we do have a lot of roof problems here. You can see the standing water. We've kept after it. And for the most part, we don't have any water coming in. But periodically, we get the infiltration. And we have to have the roofers out. and at some point are probably going to have to re-roof, but that's not a cost-effective thing to do in a building this age because there are other issues with the walls and the whole building system. As you can see, we're at, we are in a stairwell between the first and second floor. We have our bench here where we also have a number of tutors working here on the bench. And up above me, we have another stairwell area where it's set up as a reading center so that children can stay there, read, and sometimes be tutored there also. We also have our bookshelf there so they have ready access to materials. Well, Mr. Hall, I want to thank you. We appreciated you showing us around and showing us some of the challenges that you have at McKinley. And we can see that uh, you know, this is an old school, but you know, you've done a good job in trying to make do, and your teachers have done a fantastic job, and obviously the students are learning very well. So we thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here. We had an opportunity to see some of the issues at McKinley Elementary School, and now we're at this old school, Ely Elementary. And we have with us Dr. Jack Deby, who's the principal of Ely Elementary. And Dr. D.B. will give us some information about the challenges in trying to deliver an educational program in a building of this age. Well, Ely was built in 1921, so the, when the school was built, there wasn't much thought about technology, computers, how we instruct students today. And as we go on our tour, you'll see some things like a computer lab that's in a space that wasn't really designed for computers, uh, wiring across the building, uh, floors that are buckled. Uh, water damage in areas and just a lot of challenges in trying to educate our students for tomorrow in a building that was built for many, many decades ago. 
We are in the Ely Computer Lab right now, and this is a very small room, as you can see. And actually, we have several fans and an air conditioner and windows to keep the room cool enough so the computers don't overheat. We have 28 computers jammed into this room, and we're kind of limited as to where our computer lab goes because on the other side of the room is our network hub where the computers are located. Um, this room is adjacent to the media center and it's used quite a bit. This is the only place in our building that we have this many computers in one spot and this is a group of fifth grade students right now that are uh, busy working on some extended responses as they prepare for the OAA. With me is Ms. Dupree who's a fifth grade teacher at Ely School and has been at Ely School for 34 years if I remember correctly. 39. 39 years and would you like to tell them what your students are doing right now? Right now, my children are working on the OAA, as Dr. DB has stated. They're working on extended response, and um, we're uh, reinforcing the learning. If you look around, you'll see that every child is um, responding to the questions differently because this is differentiated instruction. Their responses are amazing because these kids are awesome. Great. Thank you, Mr. Prey. Dr. DB, we spoke about how we had to use rooms such as locker rooms for instructional purposes at McKinley, and we didn't get a chance to see that over there. Maybe you could talk about this room, which is a former locker room. Yes, this room actually was a locker room, and in fact, behind me, they have showers, uh, restroom stalls, There's, the sink is out here, and you can see from the brick wall that this was built as a locker room. Uh, we've retrofitted it, sort of say, and we have two intervention specialists who work with students on reading and math in this area and we've put a couple computers in here, we've made fake walls with bookcases, um, put up some bulletin boards to make the space a little bit more um, lightning, but it actually was and is still fitted with uh, the water if need be to turn into a locker room someday. All right. Right now we are in a third grade classroom and the reason we're in this classroom is despite the beautiful bay windows behind me, this room and about six others in the building have a unique floor situation. The floor is not level. In fact, it's buckled in numerous places due to water damage over the years. Um, you can put a ruler on the floor and you can see that the ruler will not go straight across the floor. You could roll a marble in a few spots and the marble will roll from one end to another but these beautiful old wood floors certainly have seen better days. This room I also might uh, point out has a fireplace in it. It has games in it right now, but this is a room that originally was built with a fireplace and they don't build schools like that anymore. And this room that we're in is a Title I reading room. We have a group of fifth grade students working with a reading teacher right now. And this was a space that we created to provide instruction for students in reading. And we um, do have heating in this room, as you can see above me. And we also have internet in this room, as you can see. This wasn't probably the original design for the room based on all the plumbing pipes and other wires across the building. But the uh, students certainly get a nice view of the outside with the windows. And when it's raining, they know that as well. We're now in the boiler room at Ely Elementary School, and while these have certainly been workhorses over the years, they also pose some challenges for heating the building and for keeping them running, and Dr. DB may be able to speak to a little bit of that. Sure, the boilers obviously do their job, but parts of the building get very hot, other parts of the building stay cool, and since these don't really have modern uh, controls with them that's a little bit difficult to keep all of the rooms in the building at the exact same temperature at the exact same time but they certainly do work and um, we try and make the best of these good old boilers. We're now in a lower level that houses several classroom spaces and Dr. DB tell us a little bit about this area. Sure this is the basement at Ely School and this area has actually been subdivided into three different classrooms, two full-size classrooms and then a smaller uh, reading classroom. And one of the challenges we've had with this particular area is the emergency door you see behind me. We continuously would have a lot of water and um, rain that would flood through the classroom. We've had numerous um, carpet replacements and took several attempts to actually get the 
problem rectified. But we are actually below sea level in this room at Ely School. This is below the main floor. And we have two first grade classrooms and a reading room in here. And it's turned out to be a nice size instructional space. Uh, just had a lot of challenges to work through with this being an old building. Well, Dr. Deby, we'd like to thank you very much for the tour that you've given us and some of the insights into the challenges of providing a program in a building like this. Thank you, Rich. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Well, that's it for now. I hope we do see you on June 2nd at our big celebration at Elyria High School. Until then, We'll see you later.